Hello, hello everybody, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Janine Davidson, and I'm the president of MSU Denver. We are so excited to have Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster joining us today for a conversation. This is actually part of our President Speaker Series, where we bring in local, national, and international luminaries, that would be you, HR, to campus, usually, um, to share their expertise with our students and our faculty and even the broader community. I'm so glad that we're able to continue to do this virtually, even though we would much rather have had you here in person. Um, in the past, we've actually had President uh, Mexico, Vicente Fox and his wife Marta. We've had Dr. Samson Davis, who's a political strat and political strategist, Donna Brazil, Yolanda Caraway, and Lee Dartrey. Um, we've also had, um, uh, oh, and Minion Moore, that's right. And they were the author of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics. So we like to, like to focus in on what's happening in the world and in America. So our guest today is Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. He was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, otherwise known as the National Security Advisor. He served on active duty in the Army for 34 years, and he was a West Point grad. He actually also has a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he's currently a lecturer at Stanford, and he's a fellow at the Hoover Institute, Institution and the Freeman Spogli Institution. H.R. McMaster wrote a book called The Dereliction of Duty, which is about Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the lies that led to Vietnam. It's actually required reading, probably still, uh, for so many military officers. Um, he's basically a big deal, and we're super excited uh, to have him here today. H.R. Uh, and I go back, I don't know, about on a decade or so, working, we worked a lot together off and on in those sort of Washington orbit, I, we're trying to figure out where we first met, and I really don't know, but I remember it had to do with trying to unfarkle the Iraq War. And uh, HR was doing it in combat and also back in Washington and also in the think tanks. He's sort of a full spectrum military leader and thinker. Um, we have a lot to agree about with respect to the nature of conflict and the way in which America has and has not uh, uh, dealt with that. Uh, we don't always agree, as I also learned reading your book. <laughs> um, but let me, I, I want to start with, uh, with something to set the stage about who this guy really is as a leader. When I was at the Council of Foreign Relations, I used to write a blog. And um, one time after the Veterans Day, uh, HR had given a big speech at Georgetown. And I loved it because it basically said lots of things that I agreed with <laughs> to, to include the importance of history and things like that. So I called him up and asked if I could publish the entire speech on my blog. And he said yes. And then the comments started rolling in. And I, you know, we, you always get comments on these things, but the, you have the award for the, for the best comment I ever got on any blog I ever wrote. I don't know who this guy was, HR, but apparently he served under you when you were a colonel. And he said, I would follow Colonel McMaster to the gates of hell just to watch him kick the devil's ass. <laughs> that says something about your leadership style, <laughs> but it was also, uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. So that's the kind of leader he is. He gets stuff done. He's a big thinker. We are super excited to have him here today to talk about his book um, called Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. How easy could that possibly be? Um, it goes, it covers all kinds of administrations. Uh, it does, it starts with a sentence that says, um, this is not the book that people wanted me to write because I'm pretty sure that what people wanted you to write was some sort of palace intrigue about the white working for uh, President Trump. That's not what you wrote, but you do talk about the man and uh, other presidents in the book a lot. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So what we're going to do is we'll start with um, a few questions from, from me, because I'm the moderator and the president. It is the president speaker series, after all. And then we'll turn it over to our political science chair, Dr. Robert Preuss, and he will moderate the q and I want to say thank you to all of you who are tuning in. And so many people, we have over 300 people on the line today. Um, we had so many people send in some great questions, which we'll try to cluster into themes. Um, and you can also put some questions up in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to that um, as well. So let's just uh, get right into it. All right. um, let me start with and get this political piece out of the way here with the civil military thing. Um, 
some of the questions that came in from some of the students and, and others, I think, indicate how people don't really quite understand what a national security advisor is um, and why an active duty three star general could think that they could take a job like that and not become politicized. So I want to let you take a crack at answering that for us. Okay. Hey, hey thanks, Janine. Hey, what a pleasure it is to be with you. And and hey, thanks for your tremendous service, you know, in the Air Force, in our military, you know, as in government, and now as president of MSU Denver. And I'm sure that all of your students and faculty realize how lucky they are to have you at Leiden University. And, and what a pleasure to see you and, and to be with everybody here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, well, I think, you know, this was the, President Trump was the fifth commander in chief I served, right? I, I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States when I entered West Point at the age of 17. And, and you know, I was studiously a political gene, as you know, because we've had lots of discussions about this and the importance of maintaining this bold line between the military and, and partisan politics. And I took the kind of extreme view uh, uh, of it uh, such that I never even voted when I was in active duty. And I, I encourage everybody to vote. Please don't misconstrue me here or to think that I really expect other soldiers and officers to act the same way I did. I think I think everybody should vote, that's fine. But for me, I followed the example of General George Marshall who, who, who recognized the, the importance of the military staying out of partisan politics and decided himself to, to be studiously apolitical. A and so when President Trump asked me to, 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 to interview uh, for the job of National Security Advisor, that was an easy choice for me. It was a kind of a bonus round for me. I was in my 33 year, years of service in the, in the Army, and, uh, and it was an opportunity to continue serving to help a newly elected president, I hoped, administer a corrective to what I think were some, some unwise policies of, of past administrations and to, to advance and protect our interests. I think, it, I think a National Security Advisor can and actually should discharge his or her duties in a way that is not partisan political. Of course, you're serving the elected president. You are there to help that president pursue his or her agenda in that job. And, and, and it is a unique position, of course, in the foreign policy establishment, uh, because you're the only person who has the president as his or her only client. But of course, it's not unprecedented for a military officer to do that job. Colin Powell did that job. Uh, you had Brent Scowcroft, who sadly we lost earlier this year, who did the job of deputy national security advisor uh, in uniform and then transitioned into, into civilian, uh, into a civilian role as national security advisor later. But just to answer your question quickly, the five key tasks you have to do as a national security advisor, I think you can do these five key tasks with, without being partisan political. The first, staff the president, prepare the president for his or her engagements on foreign policy and on national security, whether that's hosting a foreign leader or foreign travel or, or discussions with, you, with, with, uh, with members of Congress on, on these issues. The second key task is to run a process. Run a process that I think should deliver multiple options to the president so the president can make decisions consistent with his or her agenda and also to deliver, of course, best analysis of the challenges we're facing or events that are important to our foreign policy and national security. Uh, and, the, 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 and, and, uh, and the third a key task is to communicate, to communicate the president's policies and decisions. These are statements of policy, right? These are not, you know, this is not engaging in partisan politics and and, and especially I think in the areas of foreign relations and national security, they, they shouldn't be seen through a partisan lens. The fourth key task is to help ensure unity of effort with like-minded partners, our allies and, and, like, and, and, and partners across the world. And I, I enjoyed that part of the job uh, immensely and built very strong relationships with my counterpart national security advisors, some heads of state who I knew before I even went into the job, uh, and then other members of, of, of um, you know, other officials in, in foreign governments uh, to help uh, you know, really us work together in a synergistic way. And then finally, you lead an organization, right? You have the National Security Council staff, a lot of uh, dedicated uh, and extraordinary talented uh, civil servants and, and, and political appointees, and you want to provide them with what we call in the army, you know, purpose, motivation, and direction. You want to build a, a climate within that organization in, in which people are bound together by common purpose and mutual trust and, and respect. You want people to be able to come to work every day and think, hey, I can make a difference, right? And, and so, you know, that kind of leader, leadership is important too. And I, I really felt, you know, nobody's really, you know, completely prepared for a job of, you know, that scope and responsibility. 
I, you know, I felt that the opportunities I had in the army uh, to, you know, to study national security council, national security decision making from a historical perspective, but then to be part of, of, of military, civilian, multinational teams in places like Iraq and, and Afghanistan, I, I felt like, uh, you know, I, I had something to bring to the job and, and, and could help, you know, could help the president succeed and could help advance and protect American interests. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think you can do it in a political way. I, I think I did it in that way. And, and uh, as long as I lasted, you know, and it was, uh, it, right. was, it, was a, it was a privilege to do it. It was a privilege to do it. Very good. Well, you mentioned uh, the study of history and um, this is a big deal for uh, universities, for higher education in general, where a lot of people are starting to say, why do you need to study history and philosophy? You know, what kind of jobs are you going to get with that? And there, you know, people, I mean, our, our own history and philosophy and, you know, cultural departments feel like they're really under the gun. Um, I would really love to hear your take on uh, why you think studying history is so important, like for our democracy and for people. I mean, parents out there, let your kids study history. Why? <laughs> Well, what you need, I, you know, of course, I'm biased as a historian, right? So don't, don't ever ask a historian what to study history because you're going to get a mouthful, right? But, but I, I think, first of all, it, to not study history, I think we should regard that as profoundly arrogant because what you're saying is all you need to know is like your own experience, right? You don't need to learn from the experience of others. And then to think that anything that we're dealing with today is unprecedented, okay, actually, it's not, right? There's a great deal of of continuity, we tend to be biased as Americans in favor of change, right? We're enamored with emerging technologies. That's good, it's part of our creativity as a society. But we neglect continuities in the human experience at our own peril. And what history can do, it's not gonna give us like a blueprint for what to do today or in the future, but history can help us ask the right questions. It can sensitize us to the complex causality of events and contingency in history and the very complicated political and, and, and human and social and cultural factors, right? That, that, that influence uh, the, the trajectory of, of our experience, our human experience, our experience as a country and as a society. And, and I think that very importantly, you know, history does provide us, you know, with a dose of, of humility. You know, I think it's sometimes this overly theoretical approach that we take to foreign policy, for example, really encourages people to fit these very complicated challenges into an overly simplified framework. And, and therefore, we take an approach, and what I write about in Battlegrounds is an approach to the world that is actually kind of narcissistic mm -hmm. because we define the world only in relation to us and how we would like it to be. And we think that, oh, it's, it's our actions or, 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 decision, or decisions not to act that are decisive to the outcome. Well, well guess what? I mean, others have authorship over the future uh, as well. And that's, I think, a fundamental lesson uh, of history. So I, I think history is, is, is immensely important for these reasons. Uh, and you can you can at least avoid making some of the same mistakes, right? And, and I write about in the conclusion of, of Battlegrounds, the lessons I learned from reading, thinking, researching, and writing about how and why Vietnam became an American war that I brought with me to, into the White House. So I, I walk in the White House that first day, like right after the president, uh, the president hired me after the interview. I wasn't even living in Washington. So there wasn't a lot of time, right, to you know, to, to prepare, to think about it. Uh, but, but as I walked into what to, for me was McGeorge Bundy's office, right? The National Security Advisor during, during the period I wrote about, I thought, well, you know, now I'm in charge of that flawed, what I, what I said was a flawed process back then. Uh, so I better do something about that. And I, I read about the, the measures we put in place to at least avoid some of the same pitfalls. Do you think he did? I, that's what, another question. A couple of people ask questions about, uh, kind of if you had to write that book again today, The Dereliction of Duty, um, where you really, really, you know, laid into the, you know, the, the military leadership for basically not not doing their job. Do you think that that it's gotten better or, you know, for the academics on the line, it's one thing to write about it. And then it's sort of like, oh, dog caught the bus. Now I have to do it. Right. So <laughs> what, what would you, you think a, a, a retired lieutenant general would write the same book today? Or do you think also that it's changed over time? I think I would have written the same thing, Janine. I mean, I really do. I mean, I, I think that my experience uh, in, you know, in the Trump administration as national supervisor reinforced a lot of the same lessons, right? That, you know, hey, personalities and relationships are of paramount importance. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's important, uh, I, I think, to, you know, to define challenges and problems before you do something, before you rush into action. And we, and we try to put in a process, we did, 
uh, in which we frame complex problems, apply design thinking to our to our biggest challenges. It's it's important to question assumptions on which policies and strategies rest. Oftentimes, these assumptions are implicit and therefore go unchallenged. I think that was an important lesson. I think it's an important lesson, but especially in issues that involve life and death, right? Wartime decisions. It's important not to allow domestic political considerations to have primacy in such a way that the long-term costs and consequences of decisions are masked and not apparent uh, to the president. I think it's a disservice, right? To give the president a single option, right? I mean, I, I think that you know, the, the president is the person who was elected, right? He or she should get to, to choose the, the, their, their, own, their own policies. So these are some of the things we put in place that I think had very good policy effect you know, during the 13 months that I lasted there, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I think it administered in some cases some overdue correctives uh, to unwise policies. I would say China, the, the China uh, policy foremost among them. Sure, sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned the strategic narcissism, which is a huge theme throughout the book. And, um, you know, I, my head's going back and forth, especially all the work we did with the Middle East work with the wars. And it's sort of like, um, is what's going on in the Middle East because we are there, or because we're not there. And um, I think that the decision-making process, one of my critiques was, um, wasn't a strategy conversation for so many years in both all both administrate all three administrations it was a, a debate over how many troops should be there which isn't strategy at all i mean so many of those issues that, that came back in the book that i was just like remembering you know I but know, it was a, it's a bit traumatic for both of us I think. <laughs> right, <you> know, <laughs> wow um yeah i mean the first big mistake was going there in the first place the second big mistake was leaving prematurely you know you could just go on and on and on but Talk a little bit about strategic narcissism. I mean, it goes throughout the whole book and I, I find myself still saying, well, is it because of us or is it not because of us? And how, you know, at what point, if you think that, it, that it's all, that it's not because of us, then leaving doesn't matter, but then you see that it does, right? So what, what, what can you tell us about this massive um, sort of theme throughout your book? Well, I, I think what, what I begin in the, in the 1990s, really, I mean, what I, throughout the book, what I try to do is Again, explore uh, how how the recent past it, it produced the present as the first step in making suppositions about the future. And so I, I go back to the to the end of the Cold War and, and tell the story about patrolling the East West German border, and then one moment you know, staring down East German border guards, the next moment seeing the gates thrown open and, and throngs of of East Germans bearing bouquets of flowers and bottles of wine, and and how they were you know, there were hugs and, and tears and joy. We won the Cold War. And so there was reason to be confident. Then there was the overwhelming tactical victory over Saddam's and complacency. And see, in the 90s, were a setup. We're set up for complications we had we had later. And 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 foremost among these these assumptions was that hey, there's an arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. Another assumption was that hey, great power competition, that's a relic of the of the past, right? And there's going to be a condominium of nations, and we'll work together under this rubric of you know global governance, and we'll work on the world's problems together. And then the third and related assumption was that an overlapping assumption is that we were going to have dominance, right? Dominance militarily, uh, you know, no one would be able to really challenge our security. This was all set up for disappointments. So I think we got a little bit of a freeze on on your screen there, HR. Strategic shocks in the form of the mass murder attacks. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, better now. Yeah. All right. How about now? Okay. Is it coming yeah. back? I think you have a little bandwidth issue, maybe. Um, okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll try to remedy this. If it happens again, I'll switch to another. Okay. Source here. <laughs> Sorry, the pandemic problems. And and uh, and and so you know, I I think that 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 emotional impetus of over optimism mm -hmm. shifted to pessimism and resignation and. And so it's really not a question of, of whether or not our actions, right, our interventions are decisive or our disengagement is decisive. It's this interaction with adversaries, rivals, and, and uh, who have a say in the future course of events, who have authorship uh, over the future. And, and so this is why in the book I make this case, right, this case for strategic empathy, right, which is viewing these complex challenges from the perspective of the other and to recognize that they too. Uh, sh share with us uh, agency and influence over the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, it's it's so complex. I mean, and I think 
I think, you, you know, you're really right in, in how Americans, they have this, you know, just sense of optimism that, you know, we can just do anything. And you saw that with Vietnam, you saw that with Iraq. Um, I mean, I remember teaching a class where my students were before 9-11 asking, why, why did America think they could do this in Vietnam? After 9-11, people didn't ask me that question. 20 years later, they started to yeah, ask I, it again, right? So you see that's this. Right, that's right. And you know, you know the, point, the, the point that uh, the historian Conrad Frame makes, who has really great sayings, right? One of, his, one of his sayings is that, you know, there are two ways to fight the, the United States, or really any, any, any uh, country or any you know, military, asymmetrically, right, and stupidly. And you hope that your you hope that your enemy picks stupidly, but they're unlikely to do so, especially if they learn vicariously through the experience of others, like Saddam in '91. And then the the second thing that he often says is is that uh, is that we've never been able to never do it again, and it is really the need to consolidate military gains into sustainable political outcomes, right? Unless it's just a raid or something, you know, I, this has never been just an optional phase of war. And I, what I argue in the book, Janine, is is that it, it was our short-term approach to these long-term problems that lengthened the wars and, 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 uh, and, and made the costs uh, higher uh, than they needed to be. Right. Conrad Crane is a, is a military historian at the Army War College and a real good you know, friend and brilliant historian. Um, but yeah, that's, that's exactly, we talk about the cheap coat of paint strategy, right? We think we ignore history, Every bone in our body knows, like his, from as a historian or even as a military strategist, that you that counterinsurgency or something like happened in Iraq or Afghanistan that it will take decades. But then we, for some reason, think we can just do it one year at a time. Right. And then right. all of a sudden, really, we really, really, yeah. <laughs> really, 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 the next war will be fundamentally different from all those that have gone before. That's kind of the argument you hear. Right. right? And, it, well, and, and you mentioned right, Bosnia, right? I mean, remember Bosnia was going to be a one-year mission. Hey we're, hey, we're still there, right? We're there yeah. with, a, with a very small and, and sustainable le level of troops, and it's mainly a diplomatic uh, effort to, to keep the peace there. But I, I think you know, there are no short-term solutions to long-term problems. And I, I give the examples of Plan Columbia, which was a successful long-term engagement at a sustainable level of effort. Uh, and then also Korea. You know, After the Korean War, the situation was pretty bleak, right? I mean, South Korea was a country that was ravaged by decades of war and, and brutal occupation, didn't have any natural resources, had a, had a literate population, a corrupt government and a hostile neighbor. Okay, how's that, how's that gonna work out? Well, right. I mean, it worked out fine, you know, but not until decades later, not until economic reforms in the 70s, democratic governance reforms in the 80s. And so, you know, I, I think we have to be able to stick with it. Not that we need massive numbers of troops or to spend hundreds of billions of dollars uh, abroad, uh, but 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 it is in our interest to prevent threats to, to our nation from growing abroad, because as we know from COVID-19, for example, right, once it reaches our shores, the cost of coping uh, with, with these problems can be exorbitant, right? 9-11, right. I think, is a similar lesson. So the, the argument in Battlegrounds is mainly an argument for sensible and sustained engagement in, in the world. Right, right. Well, I mean, it, it turned out okay for South Korea. <laughs> Not necessarily for North Korea and for the right. tensions in the peninsula in general, but you're right. And we're still there and um, it still hasn't blown up into a, a hot war again. And, you know, is it strategic narcissism to believe that it's because we're there? I don't know. If well, I, think I, I think, I, you know, I think we should be more confident, Janine. You know, this there is this school of thought these days uh, that views our disengagement from complex problem sets as an unmitigated good. And as you know, it's, it's growing. I think uh, you're to, in, in popularity because people are generally frustrated, right, with the, the length and difficulty and costs of, of, of our, our overseas engagements uh, and, and the wars in Afghanistan, and Iraq, and Syria in, in particular. Uh, but but the argument actually that 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 many of, of these organizations, individuals make is profoundly narcissistic because mm -hmm. it doesn't give our adversaries and rivals doesn't acknowledge that they have any aspirations except in relation to us, right? So right. if we're the problem and we disengage, right, the problem's going to get better. Well, we know that's not the case with jihadist terrorist organizations, for sure, right? We didn't cause Iran's four-decade-long proxy war against us. We didn't cause uh, Vladimir Putin's sustained campaign of political subversion. I mean, he came into office determined to do that based on his sense of honor lost after the collapse of the Soviet Union and his drive to restore Russia to national greatness 
really and, and understanding that he had limited resources to do so. And so his his strategy is to drag us all down, right? To, to to divide us, to pit us against each other, to reduce our confidence in our our democratic principles, institutions, and processes. We didn't cause the Chinese Communist Party's aggression, right? If you if you look today at what the Chinese Communist Party is doing after foisting COVID nineteen on the world with the repression of, of the news of human to human transmission, they're punishing the doctors who are trying to raise the alarm, subverting the World Health Organization, but now adding insult to injury with this wolf warrior diplomacy uh, aimed really mainly at Europe and, and the United States, massive cyber attacks in the midst of a pandemic right against our against our pharmaceutical companies, medical research facilities internationally, uh, the massive attacks on Australia, cyber attacks, the, 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 the cultural genocide campaign in Xinjiang and, and Xi Jinping just two weeks ago saying, hey, you know, it, 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 we're going we're gonna to expand that, that campaign. We're going to put some additions on in these concentration camps. You know, Uyghur birth rates, by the way, are down 60%. Uh, the extension of the party's repression to Hong Kong, the aggression in the South China Sea, that uh, that if, if China succeeds would be, you know, you know pardon the expression, but the largest land grab, you know, in, in history. The threats to Taiwan, now the marshalling of missiles opposite of Taiwan, aggressive actions against Japan, bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the, the Himalayan frontier. So tell me again how this is a U.S.-China problem. Hey, this is a, a free world China problem. And, and Xi Jinping is exercising his agency through a very sophisticated and increasingly aggressive effort to export his authoritarian mercantilist model in a way that if he succeeds, the world will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe, right? So, so I think we have to not, not be so arrogant as to think that these other actors only have aspirations in reaction to us. Actually, they have their own agendas. So I take that to mean that you would think you would say that China is the biggest threat to the U.S. right now, or not? Or is I, it... I would say I would say yes, absolutely, uh, based just on the scale of the threat and and the very sophisticated and pernicious strategy they're pursuing. A, a, a strategy that I describe in, in battlegrounds as you know as co-option, mm -hmm. coercion, and concealment. Right? Co-opt us with you know, you know, the, the lore of, of profits. You know, look at the and this is the cycle of the NBA. Many other any other companies that want to do business in China, uh, with you know co-opt uh, countries, right? With you know with the apparent benefits of, of of Chinese loans, which are in fact debt traps. And then once you're in, to coerce you, to coerce you to support the party's policies and to support or at least turn a blind eye to some of their most aggressive uh, and hostile actions economically, uh, but also in connection with with how they treat their their own their own population. Uh, and and then and then to conceal all of this activity, so it's just normal business practices, right? And mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, for example, can give a speech as he did recently uh, to portray himself as an environmentalist while they're while they're building seventy coal-fired plants a year and, and poisoning the world with carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to really look at the party for what it's actually doing uh, and, and do so in, in a way that. Uh, that, that, that fosters cooperation uh, across free and open societies to compete more effectively. In terms of the, you know, direct back on the U U.S., um, I'll ask one more question, then I'll turn it over to Robert. But, um, you know, you're making the point that, well, you didn't, you suggested, I, I inferred, but, um, you know, what China does with respect to us, similar to what Putin does with respect to us, <clears throat> is they, they leverage the very things that make our society and our democracy things that we're proud of, you know, open, free communications, um, free trade, all these kinds of things. And then it ends up kind of twisting itself around into some sort of um, Alice in Wonderland. Um, so one of my questions is, given that sort of threat that's out there and the way you write about it in the book, which I believe is, is actually happening, um, stoking our um, latent uh, grievances or um, polarization, um, and then I'm thinking about another thing you talk about in the book a lot, which is, um, you know, when we're in places like the Middle East and, you know, a primary objective is to help those countries, you know, get away from violence and turn towards the democratic processes to work out their differences and their grievances. And when I'm thinking about what's happening in the United States right now, if this were a, a a partner nation that we were trying to help. Are we falling into those traps where people are potentially going to turn to violence instead of, 
you know, re, you know, doubling down on our democratic processes and free and fair elections and tr peaceful transfers of power. And I think a lot of people are, are worried about that right now, two weeks away from a huge election. Right. Well, you know, Janine, as you know, I've served for many years in, in places that were given to, to, to tribalism, to separation uh, and, and polarization of populations where there, there wasn't a rule of law that provided equal protection under the law to citizens. Uh, where citizens felt disenfranchised, right? Because they, they believed they didn't have a say in, in how they're governed. And the only way for them to advance and protect their interests was through violence. And you know, the picture is not pretty, right? It's, it's, it's disastrous actually. And so I write in the, in the conclusion about really a need for us to make a concerted effort, not only to improve our, our strategic competence, but also our confidence, our confidence in who we are as a people and our confidence in our democratic processes and, and institutions. Uh, and in our common identity as, as, as Americans. Uh, I, I mentioned in the book really, uh, you know, uh, the paragraphs on education that are, that, are, you know, that, are, that are actually relevant to your mission mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, at, at MSU Denver and the work that you're doing uh, and the work that your students are, are doing and your faculty are doing. The greatest strength of our nation is an educated populace. They can, they can see through these efforts to divide us. An educated populace that understands really the full scope of our history and allows us to take pride in the radical idea of our revolution, that sovereignty lies neither with king or parliament, but with the people, but also to recognize the, the blight on our history of slavery that wasn't removed uh, until though our, our most destructive war in history that resulted in the emancipation of 4 million people. We should take pride in that, uh, while also still allowing ourselves to be disappointed uh, mm -hmm. with the failure of reconstruction, the, the rise to Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan, separate but equal, and and de jure segregation and inequality of opportunity. But again, we should have pride in the great achievements of the civil rights movement in dismantling de jure segregation, mm -hmm. uh, while still recognizing there's de facto inequality of opportunity in our country. There are huge in in inequalities of opportunity associated with education itself. Uh, it, it, our, our, our chances as Americans to participate in the American dream should not be limited based on what zip code we're born into and this opt-out system in education in which, in which those who don't have the resources to opt out are, are stuck with substandard educational opportunity, for example. We have a lot of work to do in this country to ensure equal treatment under the law, to ensure that uh, equal treatment you know, by, you know, by police of, of, of minority populations and, and black Americans in particular. Okay, but let's get to work on it. I think what we could do is celebrate the fact that we do have a say in, in how we're governed. We can demand better from our elected leaders and we can demand better from each other. But what we have to do is we have to empathize with one another. We have to come together as Americans. And while we can, we can celebrate kind of micro identities and, and so forth, I, I'm concerned that there is an interaction happening between identity politics on one extreme, you know, and the so-called you know, critical theory and cancel culture, and then bigotry and racism on the other. And what's happening is this interaction is creating centripetal forces that are pulling us apart from one another. We have to stop this, right? I think it, it, it is possible for us to get to know each other again, you know, for us to, 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 to come together for respectful civil discussions. One of the purposes of the book is to have those kind of discussions around issues that, that maybe, maybe are not as controversial I mean, as, or, or, or partisan, I think, as some of the domestic uh, political um, or you know, policy uh, issues. Uh, so that we can we can get to know each other again as Americans, you know. I think we're you know we're more connected to each other electronically, and 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 more disconnected from each other than ever emotionally, you know, and psychologically, and 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 we are suffering from a polarization of our political elites, polarization of our media. Like I think we should lament the fact that if you lean in one political direction, you watch one cable TV show and it, and it was in the station. If you lean in another, you watch one of two others. You know we. Uh, you know, our, I think own, we, our own little echo chambers. Yeah. Right. And, and the pseudo media, you know, with these, you know, with the, with the, you know, these conspiracy theories and then, and then social media, right. That, that uses algorithms to actually drive us apart from one another further by showing us more and more extreme material consistent with our predilections so they can get more advertising money. Right. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to realize you know, we're doing this to ourselves and, and uh, I think you know, it's past time well, for us we're to- We're also being together. stoked by some external actors too. It is, absolutely. Just it's being, cool, we're cool being and, and, and I just, I think as a first step though, like how about just stop, you know, stop, not be our own worst enemies, right? Yeah. And I tell the story in Battlegrounds of the 2016 election and, and how it, in that case, and, and since then, 
both political parties have at times compromised our principles in pursuit of partisan advantage over the other, right? We've got to, we have to stop doing that, right? And, 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 uh, and, and demand that our leaders stop. It. So um, yes, some troubling times. Um, well, I, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to our chair of the political science department. He's been, uh, it looks like we've got at least 10 more questions that have come in in addition to the ones that came in prior. So um, Robert, over to you. Well, you know, and we have a, an exceptional student body and lots of really smart questions. So we'll try to get to, to all of them and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and just ask the questions. But I think, you know, your last comments there were a good segue to a number of questions dealing with cyber security and, and misinformation. And I guess, you know, it's a two-parter then. Um, you know, what's the implication for a really divided public uh, for national strategy? I mean, does it matter at all to, to you as a, or as a strategist? Um, but also then, if, if it does, and if, even if it doesn't, you know, what role does you know, preventing misinformation, uh, particularly from, from foreign countries, really, what do we need to do about that in terms of the strategic endeavor? Well, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think first and, and foremost, uh, it's important for us to, to understand these problems more fully. I think that those who are most polarized on these issues are those who know the least about them, right? And and what I what I what I what I advocate for in the book is to hey, let's at least begin conversations with a more full understanding of the challenge itself, you know, the implications on us and on future generations of, of Americans, and then start the conversation with what we can agree on, right? I think you know this applies, for example, to to issues like climate change, right? I mean, I think we can we can agree on the vast majority of Americans. So now I'm accepting. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not concerning like climate deniers and so forth. We can agree that climate change is happening. We can agree that it's man-made. We can agree that it's bad. And we can agree that we can do a lot about it, like right now. And so we have to we have to transcend what the dynamic of of either climate deniers having the loudest voice or or green new dealers who are proposing non-solutions to have the loudest voice. We need actually real solutions uh, to 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 these these problem sets. And so so I, I think we can transcend it. Uh, and we can have a sustained foreign policy. To, you know, to Robert, to get to your question, and uh, you know, it does make a difference because if we are incapable of implementing a long-term approach to foreign policy and to advancing it and protecting our our, our interests, uh, th then then of course um, we're going to be at a profound disadvantage, not only from our, our security but also our ability to, uh, to 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 ensure that future generations enjoy the opportunities and the prosperity that. That, that our country has in the past. Uh, and, and also it, it's gonna affect our ability to preserve and, and build peace. So I, I think um, it's a great question. I think it begins with education. Our, our, uh, this, book was, this book was a continuation of my self-education. You know, I learned a lot about each of these challenges and, and I hope it's a starting point for others to have these discussions, learn more about them themselves. And, and, and I, I think, I think a, a not necessarily consensus, but a common understanding and common approach uh, or what can emerge from these kind of discussions and learning more about what we're facing. Fair enough. Um, a lot of questions regarding kind of regional security within the larger national security uh, regime and strategy. So are, if you're willing, can we do a lightning round? I've got, <laughs> I've got like five different countries. Um, how about the Middle East? I mean, what are, what are the key issues that we're, we're worried about and how do you, how do you approach them? Well, you know, the, the tendency these days is to look at the Middle East as mainly just a mess to be avoided. But the problem is that just when you think things can't get worse in the Middle East, they do get worse. And, and what, if you think that problems that, that start in the Middle East stay in the Middle East, of course they don't. Uh, those are problems associated with jihadist terrorism. It's also huge humanitarian crises, especially those that are centered on the instability and insecurity in Libya uh, and how Libya has become both a source for refugees and a transit point for refugees fleeing violence in the Sahel but also really the serial episodes of mass homicide that are the Syrian civil war. And I think of the problem set in the Middle East mainly as a problem associated with a sectarian civil war, uh, a civil war that, that, that is involved with a cycle of violence, a cycle of violence that is based on ignorance, ignorance used to foment hatred and hatred used to justify violence against innocents. Uh, it is that cycle of sectarian violence that allows Iran to pursue hegemonic designs in the region uh, in an effort to keep the Arab world perpetually weak. 
uh, in an effort to push the United States out of the region and to place a proxy army on the border of Israel and threaten Israel with uh, destruction. Uh, it's also that cycle of violence uh, that, that, that generates uh, support among uh, beleaguered Sunni communities, mainly uh, for, you know, for, for terrorist organizations who then can portray themselves as patrons and protectors of, of those who face uh, you know, evisceration at, at the hands of, of, of uh, militias or maybe Hafez al-Assad's army and Iranian proxies uh, fighting alongside it. So I, I think that efforts, efforts to work on this problem set from, from uh, with partners in the region are immensely important. I think the recent Abraham Accords is, is a very positive development in which, uh, in which the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have normalized relations with Israel. I think that's important to the region, recognizing the threat uh, from Iran and Iran's 40 year long proxy war against all of us. Uh, but, but it's also important because it removes a source of ideological support uh, for criminals who use a perverted interpretation of Islam uh, to, to, uh, to commit violence against innocents. The word Abraham Accords is important because it demonstrates, it, it, it communicates that we're all people of the book. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and it, it highlights the fact that that these terrorists, uh, the vast majority of their victims are fellow Muslims. And we have to reject any efforts on their part you know, to portray uh, their heinous criminal actions uh, as in any way connected to some kind of a war of religion. So I, I think there are positive developments, uh, but, but, uh, but, but those are few in the Middle East. And just when you think the situation could get worse, it could if we disengage from playing a positive role in trying to break this cycle of sectarian violence. Thank you. Um, next region, uh, area, uh, Africa. Yeah. Well, Africa is a continent of tremendous uh, promise and, and tremendous challenges, obviously, you know, with, uh, with a young population that if afforded uh, the, the opportunity uh, to, you know, to, 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 to work in a productive and a meaningful way, uh, to, to, to be lifted out, out of poverty, uh, could, could be a, a tremendous driver for prosperity globally. Uh, but, but of course, uh, Africa is also beset from with difficulties associated with poor governance in some places, uh, corrupt governance, that, that the governments that are engaged in you know, authoritarian governments that are engaged in, in rent seeking and extractive behavior that, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that, that victimizer population. I mean, Zimbabwe is, is a case in point uh, with its, its main sponsor, China, for example. And then, of course, uh, the, 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 the continent is facing a number of interconnected challenges associated with energy, climate, uh, health, uh, uh, water, and food security. And I think it is in the interest of the entire world uh, to work together uh, with African leaders and with African civil society groups and, and businesses and industries uh, to, to help the continent succeed uh, and make the most out of the, the potential uh, that, that exists there. Uh, I, I think that there are tremendous opportunities to do so. I think the U.S. has taken some actions uh, that that, uh, that that allow uh, U.S. business uh, and the U.S. government to play an even, even even more important supportive role there. But it's really, I think, going to be the U.S. in partnership with like-minded countries, the European Union, uh, the, the the U.K., Japan, and, and others, uh, uh, who I think can help the continent reach its its full potential. Uh, I do think there is a danger of the exportation of China's authoritarian mercantilist model there. There has been the setting of debt traps for many of these countries, um, among them, you know, Ethiopia and, and Djibouti with this high speed, speed rail uh, that doesn't really uh, re uh, generate any return on investment. Uh, you have Chinese construction of the largest carbon emitter now just completing in, in Kenya, right next, next to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, there, there have been, I think, recently a pushback against, against uh, the, this China's, Chinese form of, uh, of economic aggression. Um, sanctioned in the Nigerian parliament, for example, uh, a, great, a great deal of great work by investigative journalists in the continent. But I think the priority for the U.S. ought to be uh, to, to, to help uh, those nations and peoples who want to strengthen rule of law, strengthen representative government, uh, and, and strengthen you know, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, tolerance, uh, religious tolerance, uh, uh, and, and, and tolerance of, of, of you know, of, for people of all different uh, sexual orientations and so forth, uh, th that I think that, that the U.S. could be a very strong voice, is a very strong voice in this area. As you know, probably the, the greatest humanitarian achievement 
recent decades has been U.S. Uh, U.S. work in the area of health security uh, in in uh, in Africa under PEPFAR. Uh, so sustaining these programs and efforts, I think, is immensely important. This, the U.S. government and the Gates Foundation have done has done also some tremendous work in um, in promoting uh, promoting health on the continent. So hey, I I think you know I, I don't write about as much as I should in the book. I just kind of um, looked at it as arena of competition, you know, between the U.S. and China. But Africa deserves a concerted, you know, a concerted uh, look on its own. It is, in many ways, you know, the future of the 21st century, and and there, there's a lot of, of work that that, that that African leaders and, and people have to do, and we ought to support them in doing it. So, and without going into you know region by region, maybe switching pace a little bit or switching topic, you know, along with diplomacy, then of course is military strength. Could you give us a little sense of your uh, how you feel about our current level of military readiness? Yeah where we need to be and, and where should we go? Well, we, we, we need to make uh, new investments to counter what our countermeasures developed by Russia, China, and others. And I think what Russia and China have done, China in particular, uh, because it has more resources, have studied really what they think are, what they see as our differential advantages and tried to take them apart uh, with disruptive uh, and, and emerging technologies. You see this in, in, uh, in, in counter satellite uh, capabilities, uh, offensive cyber capabilities, electronic warfare, uh, hypersonic missiles, tiered and layered air defense, uh, unmanned aerial systems, unmanned undersea systems. And, and what this requires is for us to take a look at, at how we can become more resilient as a joint military force, such that our exquisite systems that give us a, a technological differential advantages uh, are not prone to catastrophic failure, but instead degrade gracefully. I think there's going to be more of a, uh, of a value, you know, and and, uh, and 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 more emphasis there should be on capacity in our forces, the size of our forces. I do think over many years, you know, we've traded off size of you know air wings or the size of the army or whatever for you know for more for, for greater technological capability. Uh, when in fact, uh, what we are dependent on uh, for smaller forces to have bigger impact over wider areas is at risk by these countermeasures that I mentioned. So I, I think that, uh, you know, that, that we are behind. Uh, we've deferred a lot of our modernization efforts. We've been hamstrung by the Budget Control Act and, and, and the, the uh, effect on defense associated with not being able to have a predictable budget over multiple years. That's kind of compelled the Department of Defense to hang on to antiquated costly systems to maintain rather than shifting, uh, for example, to, to, to new systems that are gonna be actually less costly in, in the long run. There's a lot of work to be done here. And, uh, and I think what we don't want to do at this point uh, is to undervalue the importance of our deterrent capabilities, especially as China's becoming more aggressive. Fair enough. And, and you mentioned budgets, and maybe that's a good segue to the, you know, the power of the purse, which is essentially Congress's. What is Congress's role in national security and foreign policy relations? I mean, in a lot of ways that they've advocated to the president over, over a number of decades. Um, yeah. Is, is a more powerful Congress better, or are we where we need to be right now? Yeah, of course, I think a more powerful Congress is always better, right? If you're, you know, we Americans, I think, believe that, you know, we're not a monarchy, right? And, and, uh, and, and we should really exercise, you know, our influence on how we're governed, you know, through our representatives in, in Congress, right? It's, it's a reason, there's a reason why, you know, Article One of the, of the Constitution comes first, right? And, and, uh, and so I, I think that 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 the the, the House and the Senate uh, have very important oversight responsibilities. What I'm concerned about is is uh, is, is that some of our most experienced uh, senators are no longer with us or have retired. Uh, and same thing as as those in Congress who have had a lead role, for example, on the House Armed Our Services Committee are are about to retire. And um, and I think it's very important at this stage that. Uh, you know, the Congress be involved in, in, in oversight. And of course, uh, you know, in the Senate, you know, it, you know we, we are suffered from the loss of Senator McCain, uh, who worked in a very strong bipartisan way with, uh, with, with Senator, Senator uh, Carl Levin you know, years ago from, uh, and, and, uh, and then also, you know, Senator Lieberman and so forth. And I just think it's really important for uh, the Senate and the House to have that, that, that oversight role. Uh, because really, if, if the American people and the representatives are disconnected from and don't understand the requirements for, for a strong defense, 
uh, we, we won't invest in the capabilities that we need. So it's important, I would say, not only for Congress, but for the American people to understand better the requirements of our defense and, 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 to, and to, 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 to exercise oversight and, uh, themselves uh, and, have, and, and be, be vocal uh, about demanding you know, a cost-effective uh, military that has the capabilities that we need to, to preserve peace. Fantastic. You know, and we'll, we'll switch a little bit then to, you know, kind of questions of, of, of leadership, if, if you wouldn't mind, misplace mine, they're, they're, they're all right here. Um, what role should, should moral leadership play in international politics um, as, a, as a national force? I mean, is there an ethic besides, or how do we determine, I guess, our, our interest? And is there a role for, for ethics and morality there? Or are we looking at you know more concrete measures? Absolutely, there's a, there's a role for 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 uh, you know for ethics and and uh, and and a consideration of of what what we can do uh, to promote uh, human rights and uh, to prevent violence uh, against innocents. And and I think our foreign policy has to be you know principled in that in that connection. Uh, we also well cognizant of, of of the limits to the degree to which we can determine. Outcomes uh, that, that are relevant uh, to to the to, to human rights, such as uh, the Chinese Communist Party's oppression of its own people, the, the Gulag state of, of North Korea, the Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, you know the, the ideology of, of a revolution and and a and a, and a theocratic uh, you know autocracy that represses human freedom there. Um, you know, I, I think we have to recognize there are limits to, to our degree of influence, but we ought to still be a strong voice and. Be willing to help those who are who are, who are demanding uh, better uh, within their within their own societies, and and I, I write about in, in battlegrounds the importance of strengthening democratic uh, principles and institutions and processes, as well as rule of law, and advancing human rights. Not as not as just a Kantian uh, way of of treating men as a, and and women as a, as a, as an ends, uh, but also in a kind of a hard nosed John Stuart Mill utilitarianism way of of recognizing that in so doing, we're competing much more effectively with authoritarian and closed systems, such as those that are being promoted by the by the Chinese Communist Party. I think certainly ethics you know, leaps to the fore on issues of the use of force and in wartime. And I think you you can't go wrong with uh, <laughs> uh, with applying St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, criteria for just war, uh, and in particular. Uh, if you're implementing a strategy in war that does not have a defined just end associated with it, uh, it, it's not only that your strategy is ineffective, it's also that your strategy might be unethical as well. So I could go on about this, but I, it's a great question. And I think it's why strategists have to study philosophy uh, and ethics as, as well as history. So kind of moving away from, from strategy, a lot of questions about about actually personal leadership. And, and I guess two of them that, that come to mind. One is, what are, your, what are the key lessons? I mean, where, where do you, what would you suggest to particularly you know, our undergraduate students that are looking to you know, pursue a leadership position? And what do you really think that they need to, to concentrate on? I think the, the question to ask yourself is, what is your base motivation? And why uh, are you volunteering uh, to serve? Uh, or why are you uh, pursuing a certain career? And, and if your motivation is to accomplish something larger than yourself, to, 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 to contribute to your fellow citizens and to humanity, and you're relatively unconcerned about your own personal advancement uh, or accruing personal power uh, or wealth, I mean, I think you can accomplish quite a bit in life. And, and uh, as I look back on my time you know, in, in Washington, I was only signed to Washington once as National Security Advisor. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that 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 really the, those who could contribute most uh, in that environment were those who were there uh, to serve the country, to serve the Constitution, uh, and and to do their best, you know, to build a better future for generations to come. And and um, and and I think that those who were not there for that reason, who were there to advance their own narrow agendas or their own careers, or uh, those who were who thought their role was to obstruct, you know, decisions. Uh, so forth. I think they did not contribute in a way, uh, and and um, and and were able to serve a higher purpose. I, I would encourage young people. I mean, serve early in life. You know, I mean, it's it's um, 
your president is the best person uh, to make this, your, your university president, by the way, <laughs> President Davidson, uh, is the best person to make this case because she served on a very important commission on, on national service. And, and, you know, I think what Americans don't see, especially for the military these days, is those less tangible rewards of service, right? I think because fewer Americans are familiar with military service, they see, you know, they see the sacrifices, right, and the hardships, but don't see that the, 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 what, it, what it means to be part of an organization in, in which you're committed to something larger than yourselves, an organization in the military in, in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you. An organization where people come from all different backgrounds, you know, the different prejudices and biases, but they melt away, you know, when, when you when you train and work hard together, and especially in combat, right? <laughs> you know, in combat, you know, you, you're not checking, you know, the skin color, you know, religion, se sexual orientation of the man or woman next to you, right? You you take on essentially the qualities of a family uh, when, when you're engaged in, in this in an endeavor like the like uh, like combat with within a unit in our military, and and that's tremendously rewarding to see. I think it, it, it helps restore confidence you know, in who we are as a people, it strengthens our nation. And there are many other forms of service that you know, right? To give back in, in, in ways that are outside of the, the military. So, hey, I just encourage people to serve and you'll reap that untold benefits, unanticipated benefits of that service. Well, we're running out of time, and so we're going to leave a few a few questions still out there on the chat. We're sorry we didn't get to them, but you know, time time is time, and it moves on. So I'll throw it back to uh, President Davidson. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, Rob. Um, we are so lucky to have you on the faculty. Thank you for participating today. Um, HR, thank you for putting in a plug for public service. I think you know there's all kinds of negativity out there about um, you know Washington and politicians and whatever, and I think. People like you and I know this. We were there. We've set, we served for so many years. The vast majority of people that are working for America um, do it because they're passionate about it. And having something that you're passionate about um, makes all the difference in your career. And so lots of good lessons for our students today. Study history, study philosophy, eat your vegetables. I don't think you said that part, but I'm pretty sure you would. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Hopefully after COVID, we can get you out here in person. And um, thank you to everybody else who's on the line. HR, over to you for your final, any final comments. By the book, by the way, everybody, here it is. <laughs> right, you forgot to use the, 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 the words page turner. <laughs> Riveting. Oh, and if you're an audible listener, which I am, HR reads it himself, which is a which is also pretty cool. If, if you can get past the Philadelphia accent, right? So, hey, I, I, hey, thanks to everybody for the opportunity to be with you, Gene. Thanks, thanks to you and, and Robert for hosting this and giving me the opportunity. And 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 I just I just would just like to ask everybody to maybe give you something to do. Maybe all of us resolve to do whatever we can to help bring Americans together. Uh, and restore confidence in, in who we are. And we do have this great gift uh, and uh, of, of our democracy. Uh, as our founders knew, it was never going to be perfect. Uh, it, it required you know, continuous nurturing. Uh, so, so let's get after it, I think, and, and do what we can to strengthen uh, our nation and, and to contribute to our, our fellow citizens. Thank you so much, Janine. Great, it's so great to be with you. And thanks for your leadership of, of a great university. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you in person, hopefully soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. That's all for now. Bye-bye.